been a little quiet in here today, hasn't it? Everybody's minds are here and there. And, and I tell you, I had a tough time trying to study this morning. But nevertheless, we're going to do our post of duty. We're going to stand and we're going to preach the word of God. And the saints are going to pull on the preacher. Get all out of me. Get, if it's 10 minutes, you get all out of me you can get, okay? If it's 30 minutes, you get all out of me you can get. But you make sure you leave here with something today. That's our... That's our purpose. That's our goal to come into the house of the Lord is, is expecting to receive something of God. Uh, the lame man came to the temple expecting to receive alms, but, but he got a whole lot more because he came expecting to receive. A lot of times when we, when we come into the house of the Lord, we're, we're not really expecting that move of God anymore, but the same God that moved before can move today. It's all in our expectation and what that, that we expect from God. Now, you have a right, brothers and sisters, to expect something of God. You, you expect the minister to study, do you not? Well, you can expect God to anoint the minister. If you have a need in your life, you have a right to expect God to answer your questions on life, answer your questions on your move. It may not go with the way that you want, but you can expect God to reveal the cause to you. How many times have you got on down the road a little bit and looked back and seen where God was, was moving in your life just when you thought that he wasn't? When you thought your prayers weren't getting this high because things weren't going the way that you thought they should go, but when you got on the other side of the problem and you looked back, you seen it was the tender hand of Jehovah the whole time leading and guiding you and carrying you across the problem. I'm sure that when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, that there was many times that old Moses thought, man, I'm off the mark. I've missed it. I, I, ha I haven't made it. Or there's the Caleb and Joshua, the two that said we can take the land. I'm sure there were many times along their walk they thought, man, I've missed it. But when they got on the other side and began to look back, they seen that God was leading them the whole time. So we have the right to expect. If we can look into God's word and see that we're from the beginning, he has led and guided his people, we have the right to expect that he'll lead and guide us on into a body change, on into a rapture, on into a resurrection. As a matter of fact, we already see that there's been a resurrection. In the days of Jesus, upon the resurrection of Jesus, the Bible says that many that were in the graves arose and walked in the holy city of Jerusalem do we have that expectation when we wake up in the morning? And I've said this many times. When we wake up in the morning, we expect to drink a cup of coffee, don't we? We expect to go be able to drive to work or to drive to our destination. We expect our, our husband or our spouse to look over and speak to us. But do we wake up with the expectation of hearing, of hearing the voice of God or maybe seeing, seeing that loved one that's passed on come by your way? That's exactly the way that it's going to happen. It's not going to be magic, Brother Rick. It's not, it's not magic, but it's the word of God being manifest in us. And we have to start expecting a rapture. We have to start expecting a resurrection of the dead. You see, we have to believe those things, brothers and sisters. We have to expect them even more so than we expect our natural everyday life. We expect, you expect, that surgeon expects when you are in the surgery room for everything to be laid out exactly the way that he wants it, right? So that he can perform his duties. But we as Christians have the right to expect a rapture. To expect God to move on our situations during the day. To expect God to do these things. If, we, if, if all of what I'm saying is, is our expectations are natural, then we have no expectation for the supernatural. We, then we, we say we believe, but we don't believe, right? How many, have you ever looked? Have you ever looked for the dead? I haven't, but I think it's time that we start. I want to see the resurrection. I know that when they come, then I'm not far behind them. And you imagine what it was like, and I heard Brother Branham preaching this week before we get into the message, but he was talking about how the, that, that Jesus went into paradise. And, and he was just giving a metaphor saying, and he was saying how that maybe he got, 
He got all the saints that was there and Abraham looked at him and said, hey, can we stop by the holy city Jerusalem? So when he went to paradise and he got him and he come back down, maybe Abraham appeared to Caiaphas. And Caiaphas looked over and said, I've heard of that feller there. I know that feller, but he was gone. You see, because the resurrection isn't for the world. It's for the believer. And how they all were gathered together, but, but how the expectation to see those things needs to be upon us. Now, he preached this in 1952. Here we are in 2014, and I don't believe that we're any, any, our expectations are any closer than they were in that day. We need to be moving toward the expectation of seeing Christ come. We need to be moving this with the expectation of seeing that resurrection of the dead, of seeing that body change. And when we start expecting those things, those things will come to pass. Amen. Amen. If you will, stand with me and turn to Romans chapter eight. The same places we've been reading from. This is the, the thought that I've had for weeks, months. And uh, like I said, I don't know how long we'll be. But uh, we preached part three the last time that I preached and uh, we'll try to preach part four today. Romans 8 and chapter one. There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Verse 13 says, for if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of your body, you shall live. Everybody bow your head if you will. Gracious Lord, we're going to come to you and ask you, God, for your anointing. Ask you, God, to anoint me today, God, as I preach your word. And, and Lord Jesus, that you would come and, and quicken the hearts of the listener, O Lord. Lord Jesus, and open up their ears. Lord, because it, it takes a spiritual understanding, Lord, to understand your word. It, it's not of any private interpretation, as the word says, and, and so often the world has got that so confused that we can interpret it any way that we want to. But Lord, we can only interpret it through your spirit, Lord Jesus. So God, just be mindful of us today, Lord Jesus, as I attempt to stand here this post of duty and preach today. I ask you, God, Lord, to anoint my lips, O oh Lord, God, that the, like, like that Isaiah had the coal of fire touch his lips. So, Lord, I, I pray for that experience today. And I pray, Lord Jesus, for the congregation to have the experience of those on the road to Emmaus, God, that when we leave here today, can, that we can say, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked along the way? So, Lord, we just ask these things in the blessed name of Jesus. And the bride says, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. And the last, uh, I think it's the last three times that I've preached, I think you've got two of them on the internet, that we've, we've, we've preached along the topic of staying behind the boundary. And we've always been referring back to Rahab the harlot, that, that lady there, and for some reason God won't let me leave her alone. Now I try to move on, and, and maybe we'll move on and preach about other people today, but Rahab seems to be the type for the lady that had to stay behind the boundary as she was in that great walled up city of, of Jericho. And we preach that there are boundaries in life and we know that if you're a, a human, you have boundaries as far as you can go. You have boundaries in your job. You have boundaries as a child that your parents set for you or should set for you as I should say because nowadays children don't seem to have a lot of boundaries. They don't seem to have a lot of uh, discipline in their home and that's what discipline in is boundaries. But there's also boundaries in the word of God that, that, that we can go to and, 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 but we've got to know how to stay behind the boundary and what's gonna happen when you stay behind the boundary. It's not always pleasant serving the Lord on your flesh. And it's going to always going to be pleasant on serving the Lord in your mind. So when you have to stay behind the boundary sometimes, sometimes it puts an immense amount of pressure upon you, just like it did Rahab, to stay behind the boundary. 
See, I, I, I'm sure that Rahab had, a, had a, a human instinct to know, well, hey, because she did know that the children of Israel were going to invade this city. So she may have had a human instinct to run, but she received a commandment to stay underneath the token. And that's the same, the same exact word that we've received is to stay underneath the token. Not to go beyond the token and not to think far beyond God's word for, for our deliverance or our, or our way out, but to stay underneath the token or the Holy Ghost. See, she was given a token to, that, that said, if you'll stay underneath this cord that, you provide, that we provided for you in your window, you and your household will be saved. You see, because Rahab had a revelation of the word. Everybody else in Jericho had heard how that God was going to destroy the city. How that the children of Israel were going to come upon them and they had heard about all the things how God had to deliver them out of the hand of the Ammonites. Out of all those kings and how God had parted the Red Sea for them. And Rahab said that fear came upon them and their hearts all melted on the inside of them. But yet, even though everybody's heart was melting and everybody's heart had fear the same way that it is today, trust me, everybody's heart's full of fear when they start hearing about this Russia thing. Everybody heart's full of fear when they start they start hearing that maybe we could be bombed or 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 uh, how many people do you know are preppers what you ever heard about these preppers they they hoard up all this food and and they store up all this stuff because they think that the end of the world is coming well I got news for you the only way to prepare yourself for the end of the word is through the for the end of the world is through the word of, of God that's the only prepping that it takes hey amen you could store up all the food and all the guns and have all the ammunition you want but when God says it's over, it's over and if you were left behind somebody's going to come in and take your gun, somebody's going to come in and take your food. So the only preparation is to be like a Rahab stay underneath the revealed word for the day. Not to go beyond it and not to move back away from it but to stay underneath the revealed word that you had. She was told to stay underneath the token so she stayed Stayed underneath the token. Amen. And there's problems and there's, there's situations that arise when you stand underneath the token that, that's not always covered without the minister. Amen. You see, when Rahab, Rahab, she had emotions and feelings just like you and I. She, she went through things just like we do. Right there in, in Jericho, everybody else was preparing. Were they not? Everybody in the world says they're preparing for the end of the world. Everybody's a Christian. Everybody's got a belief. But all beliefs and all Christians, whether it's Hinduism, whether it's Muslim, which is Islam, whether it's Judaism, whether it's Christianity, every religion teaches that there's going to be an end of the world. The old Aztec Indians that maybe you've heard about what was this thing they was going to do last year the, in the winter solace, the, the end of the world was 20, was 12, 20, 2012 or something like that. Every society predicts there'll be an end of the world. Why? Do they have prophetic revelation? No. They can take a look around at mankind and know that the hatred inside of man is gonna destroy this world. God's not gonna destroy the world. Man's gonna destroy the world. God just predicted it from the foundation of the world. But God has got people that are planted in this place, that's planted in, we'll say, Jericho, just like Rahab was. Rahab wasn't anybody, Brother Rick. She was a prostitute. She run a brothel. She had women underneath her that sold their body out to men. Now, this is history that teaches this. But the Bible says that she was a harlot. She wasn't anybody special in Jericho. She wasn't the, she wasn't the mayor of Jericho. She wasn't the presbyter of the first Jericho church. She wasn't anybody but a little old woman that nobody had nothing to think about. Now, you think about yourself. And the situation that Rahab was in, you've been in. I'm sure Rahab asked herself many a time, why me? Why, have you not asked yourself, Jamie? Why me? 
Why have, how come God could choose me out of all these people that are far better candidates than I am? Have you not felt that way? I surely have. I don't think that highly of myself, I'll tell you that. When I look around at a lot better people than me, a lot of people that deserve to hear the revelation in the word of God more than I do. I consider myself blessed and I promise you that Rahab considered herself blessed that something on the inside of her sprung to life when she heard what the children of God had been doing. Something on the inside of her came to life when she heard the words out of those men's mouth when she said, you give me a true token. You see, that's the thing about it is most people don't want a true token because there's something to there's something about a true token that causes you to give up part of your Yourself. You see, if you've got a true token, for Rahab to take the true token, she had to forsake the first church down in Jericho. She had to forsake all those fake gods and everything that, that she was ever brought up under, she had to let it go. Amen. She had to take those things and place them to the side because now she was underneath the revealed word. You see, and when you step underneath the revealed word, you have to let all those things go. All those things that Paul said what? That he was pressing toward the high mark of the calling in Christ Jesus. He said he was forgetting those things which were behind. See, Paul was a Pharisee, but he had to come out of being a Pharisee. I was a Pentecostal, but I had to come out of being a Pentecostal and move on into being a Christian because I was standing underneath the revealed word for the day. That token is what that matters, brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter what the preacher thinks or what kind of education somebody has. You could be not the most smartest person in the world and get a glimpse into God's world and be the richest man that ever lived. You don't have to have a lawyer's degree. You don't have to have a doctor's degree. All you have to do is have a seed down on the inside of that heart that the word can bring to life. You see, the apple tree didn't ask to be an apple tree, did it? The orange tree didn't ask to be an orange tree. You ought to be shouting on this, and you didn't ask to hear the revealed word for your day, but when it came by your way, there was life down on the inside of you that had to come to life. When you heard the eagle scream, you had to take off to mama. You couldn't stay down in the hen house anymore. I'm telling you, you boys are going to have to learn that song. We're the eagle kind. Burton said they was working on it. I sure hope they did get her down. He said his daddy was wanting him to sing it. I heard it back in here and I thought that's exactly right. We, we are the elect of God. You see, well, there's problems and I'm gonna preach about a problem that comes with the reveal word in your day. But I want you to know you're the, you're the elect of God. There's ministers that teach you aren't the elect of God. They're teaching that's the Jews. Well, there are, there's a certain part of them that's elected, but not every one of them. The bride of Christ is his elected. She'll stand in front of everybody when that day comes. She's the apple of God's eye. Did you know that? She is his heart. She is everything. She makes mistakes in her flesh. And old Rahab, you think about Rahab here. She was nothing but an old prostitute, somebody we would probably snarl our nose up at, but yet God thought she was good enough to send a revealed word by her way and she moved to it. Now how many people has the revealed word been sent by their way and they've rejected it? How many people in Jericho had heard all about the children of Israel but it never done anything to their heart I'm sure down in Jericho they were they had fortified themselves. They had they had probably canned food or whatever they had back in those days. And I'm sure they had every building, every church or every whatever thing they had, whatever God they worshipped, was telling them there was a way out was telling them, look, it ain't gonna come to pass. It ain't gonna happen. Or yeah, it's gonna happen, but you're gonna be okay. But here's this little prostitute who had to give up her only way of living, who had to do everything standing underneath the token. She's saying, I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna be all right. And everybody would look at her, and I bet they thought, well, she's crazy. 
She don't know what she's talking about. How does she know she's gonna be all right? She's the most immoral, despicable person here. Or that's the littlest church in the area. How do they know? Because they're standing under the token. Standing under revealed word. And no matter what, she's gonna keep moving for him. She's not gonna step back. See, Rahab, it wasn't just out of fear that Rahab stayed underneath the token. It was a love for something that she had never seen. It was a love for the unseen. If you're gonna stay underneath the token, you're gonna have to have a love for the unseen. You just can't love coming to church because someday they may come and put a lock on that door and say you can't come in the building. You just can't love shouting. You just can't love speaking in tongues. But you've got to love the unseen. You've never seen God, but yet you've got to love God. You've never held him, but yet you long to hold him. You've never touched his skin, but yet you long to touch him. That, that comes from down on the inside. And that's where Rahab had her seed, was down on the inside. But with the revelations of God come some troubles. Is that not right? Not everybody's gonna like you. When you receive the word, when you receive a revelation, brothers, what's the first thing you wanna do? You wanna run out in the street and tell everybody, don't you? You want to get in this pulpit and you want to say, yeah, and you don't understand why nobody wants you to come and preach in their church, right? When you're thinking, man, I've got a hold of the greatest thing in the world and nobody wants to hear it. Nobody on the job place wants to hear it. I got nobody to call, you sisters. I got nobody I can call because if I call sister so-and-so, she's going to say, you're crazy. How could you see that in the word of God? And so what happens? Isolation. Staying behind the boundary, isolation. This is a big problem that's in the church nowadays. Or as in the bride of Christ, is her isolation. Because isolation has effects on you. It has a big effect. I mean, there are scientific studies of what isolation does to you. That's what they do in prisons to prisoners that won't conform or to pre people that are so incorrigible or so mean that they can't get them under any control. They put them in isolation. They keep them away from the general population. And that's exactly what the devil does to you. When you start seeing the word of God, he puts you in isolation. He puts you away from the general public because I'm gonna tell you that a true saint of God don't want nothing to do with the general public. Say amen. amen. He takes you away from the public. He takes you away from your church. He takes you away from everything that you ever knew that was secure and sound and puts you in isolation. And God stands there and goes, with his arms crossed, he never intervenes. Because God has faith in you. But God will intervene before it becomes, before it overwhelms you and overtakes you. He will absolutely, before it overtook Rahab, God intervened and sent them seven trumpets and, and then seven other trumpets, didn't he? The trumpets to her were, were victory. To everybody else, they were defeat. They sent, God sent the, the man of God, the, the men of God in to get her out before the destruction came. But sometimes God will step back just to show that devil what kind of confidence that he has in you. You know, if you're gonna be in this thing, there's a certain amount of isolation you're just gonna have to endure. You're gonna have to endure being separated from your old friends. You found that out when you came into the church in the first place. You realized that you couldn't run down to the bar anymore. You have nothing in common with them people, right? You couldn't hang out on the street corner anymore. Even though you wanted to, you still wanted, you still wanted your friends. You realized I just ain't got nothing in common there anymore. So, I, so then you begin to get isolated from that. 
and you get into the church and you're doing real good, then all of a sudden God shows you something, Rahab, in the word of God. And you're doing real good in the church you're in and, and you ain't got nothing against those people. And you love that situation and you love that church. But God shows you something. And he pulls you back a little bit more. And what's the, what's the enemy do? He turns everybody against you. And you get, begin to get in isolation. Then the next step, it hits your family. You begin to tell your family members things that you see in the word of God. And what happens to them? They look at you all bug-eyed and cross-eyed like, what? You believe what? For me, the first problem, the first thing that I ever encountered was I told my family that I got baptized in Jesus' name. They looked at me all bug-eyed like, what? You know, what about the titles, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, you know? And that's the way that it is being a Christian. It's always a separation from something. It's never, you're gonna, you're gonna find out in your walk with God, or I have found out in mine, that if I start seeing something that, that's produced by the world or something everybody says real good, wait for the enemy to rear his head. Because the world can produce nothing of God. They cannot produce one thing that can edify the body of Christ. And when you see the world inside the church and you see the world in a church, get away from that place because the enemy's rearing his head. He's rearing his head because it's an isolated walk being a Christian. And I'm not talking about isolated among one another. You're gonna have brothers and sisters that you can love, but the biggest battleground that there ever was is the battleground of your mind. Amen. Is that not right? In battleground, there's battles that happened in the Civil War, the Battle of Manassas, it came to an end. Civil, the World War II had many battles. Every war has many battles but they all come to an end. But that war of your mind will never come into an end until you're changed. Until you're changed, it's never gonna stop. It's always gonna be worse and worse. And the thing about it is in the church world nowadays, people are still trying to preach stuff that was good 20, 30 years ago. Well, that don't help us today. I mean, I love those things, and those things are just as real today as they are then, but there's things that's gotta be preached for today. You know, there's, there's, there's a light gotta be shed upon the enemy of isolation. Now, last time we preached about a shaking foundation. We preached about earthquakes, and you know that earthquakes are going on all the time, that I, and, I, and I showed you that in the Word of God. But did you know that that Sunday that I preached about an earthquake, in California, that that evening there was a 6.8 magnitude earthquake in the state of California. Well, not everybody else just says that's coincidental. I say that's thus saith the Lord. Amen. If the man of God preaches it, whether he's in a little town of Maitlin or in the city of New York or wherever that he is, if the man of God preaches it, it's gotta come to pass. Amen. How many people heard that this message on the internet? Heard that last message on the internet and never gave it another thought. But you know, I found it so coincidental, not because that I preached it, but how that that morning God had laid on my heart about the shaking foundation. And then here that evening, they had a big earthquake in California. They had one on March the 31st, a 7.2 magnitude earthquake. But nobody's getting ready. Nobody's scared. Everybody, we got a way around it. We got buildings built. Well, I'm gonna tell you what, she'll sit in the salt and sea or my name's not Roby Pope. Amen. I promise you that. It's the, it's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. You can't build a building big enough that God can't shake to the ground. It's man-made, it ain't God-made. There's only one building I know that's made. That, that you can't shake down, and that's the one that's coming up out of the earth. Oh, man. Amen. That's the one that's gonna be capstone by the bride. John said, oh, I looked into heaven, and I saw the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down as a bride adorned for her husband. That's the only city that'll never be destroyed. The Bible says that the earth and the elements thereof will be passed away. That's the Bible that does say it the Lord, and it's gonna happen. Amen. Build them all you want. Build them, reinforce steel. It's still man-made, it ain't God-made. 
Ask them who made the Titanic. She's so big that God can't even sink her. She sits on the bottom of the ocean to this day. That's where she sits. And if you don't think that was directly related, that's up to you. But me, knowing my God, there, he, there she sits. And yet, did anybody repent? No. Was there a great rush to the church last well, that day that I preached about the earthquake and it happened? And then the one on March the 31st? I was in one in 1989. There was no great rush to the church. People's hearts are hardened. Their vision is coded. The things they see that, what, what's the term that I'm looking for? They are, uh, there's a term when you're used to something. Your senses become dull. You're jaded or, or uh, but there's a term that I'm looking for, you're desensitized. That's what I'm looking for. You become desensitized to the situation because that it happens so much. And that's why that the Bible says that men, will, that men will say, well, you've preached it for years. Where is his coming? That's why that the same that endured to the end, the same shall be saved. Because there's been many earthquakes, but never so many. And we, and we, we preach about these things, and, and when you begin to believe them, and you begin to take it, whoa, the earth's shaking. You become a little bit more isolated from the world. Because the world, they got a way around it. That's the tectonic plates moving up and down. No, that's the voice of God. <laughs> right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Okay? When he spoke it into existence, it had to come to pass. He knew those tectonic plates was moving then. Science, does, science doesn't draw me away from God, it draws me closer too. When I start seeing all that, Jamie, about the tectonic plates are moving and the, and the waves coming up and all these things are happening, and then I begin to hear a voice saying that the enemy is the God of this world and how that he likes to take control of the elements, the wind and the rain and the earthquakes and all those things and shake things up. Yeah, he's gonna shake it up all right because he's got his disciples. But God's got a Rahab that no matter what, how much that wall's gonna shake, she knows that she's built on the north wall. Some of y'all wasn't here when I preached that. When they done an, excava an excavation of the city of Jericho, every wall had fallen except for one wall. And that was the north wall. And I don't know for sure whose house was there, but I can just about tell you whose house was sitting on the north wall. The rest of it will fall, but Rahab's house is gonna stand. But just these things have gotta be preached in this day. Not because I preach them or Rick preaches them or Burton or Brother Donnie or anybody else, but these things have gotta be preached. I like a shout. I do, I love to shout. But we gotta shed light on the situations that the saints are gonna go through in these last days. Amen. We get, the, the, the worst thing that, that, that the, the ministry can do is ask God to give them something for the people. Because then you're gonna fight the battle. Most preachers pray, Lord, give me something to preach. You know what you need to say? Give me something for them. That's right. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. You see, the, the preaching has become a style nowadays. It's become a, it's become a way, it's become a style that, and everybody likes this man's style or that man's style. But I don't care what style he has, what's he saying? What's he preaching? Is it anointed? I don't care if he runs around and acts like a wild man or if he stands right here and he speaks in a small, slow voice. As long as it's anointed from God, I want it. Amen. It doesn't matter about the style. It doesn't matter how fast he runs or how fast he doesn't run. It doesn't matter how many tongues that he talks in or he doesn't talk in. I want it straight from the portals of heaven and if it ain't from there, don't mention it. Amen. You know, that, that's what's happening is, is pressure of society makes these men feel like they've gotta come with something. 
because it makes them feel like they're not the same type of person because they don't preach like somebody else or, or because they don't have the same. Well, I'm gonna tell you what, Donnie Reagan's maybe one of the best preachers I ever heard, but I can't preach like him. I can only preach the way God gives me the ability to preach. Ed Biscoe's one of the best preachers, William Branham, Randy West, Bert Murphy, Rick Jackson, but I can't preach like them. I can only preach the way God gives it to me. But that's the way that I want it. And I hope that's the way that you want it. I hope that you want fresh bread right out of heaven. And if it takes looking back to a prophet of God, I'm gonna give it to you. If it takes looking back into the word, I'm gonna give it to you. Whatever that it takes to get you into a body change, that's what I want. You might get mad at me sometimes. You might wanna hit me with something sometimes, but I wanna give you what you need. That is a man of God, and I ain't calling myself that, but any man of God that doesn't approach this sacred office with that, he needs to repent or check his or check his call. Because it, it's not for fame or glory, let me tell you. <laughs> there ain't nothing famous about it. A lot of hours studying. A lot of times like today, I wasn't sure. You know what it's like to get up here and stand in front of people when you're not really sure what God wants you to give to them till you get onto the floor. That's hard on a man of God. That's hard on your nerves. That's part of the isolation process. That's part of me not leaning on me, but leaning on him. Amen. You see, if I lean on me and my study and then the things I can do, then it's gonna do you no good. But if I step back and lean on him, he's gonna give it to you just the way that you need it. Some of the effects of the word isolation is the state of being in a place or situation that is separate from others. The condition of being isolated. The act of separating something from other things. The act of isolating something. It's to set it aside. And when, you, and when we're called into this thing and the deeper you go into this word, the more isolated you're gonna be. And it's gonna cause you to have some physical effects. I, I, I hate to tell you this, but there's just certain physical effects, some, 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 effects, some effects that you're gonna have inherit in your genetics. Some things you just can't get around. Sometimes you just have depression and they're in your genetics or you have anxiety and they're in your, your genetics and, or you have agitation or you have homicidal or suicidal spirits and those are things that sometimes maybe you just have to deal with until you're delivered and set free but there's certain things that being a Christian is gonna cause this flesh too. When you become isolated, it causes certain things to happen in your own body. Yet we long, we're a social society. Humans are the only, are the only um, creation on planet that requires socialization. Dogs don't require socialization. Monkeys don't require socialization. The only species that requires socialization is a human being. And when you're separated from that, there's effects it's gonna have on you. That's why it says that, the, that they that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. The race is not to the quickest or the fastest, but to those that stay in the race. You've got to stay in there because you just, and there's things about it. What I'm preaching is, is nobody wants to preach these things. Nobody wants to tell you the bad parts. But if you're gonna serve God, you're gonna suffer in your mind. You're gonna suffer in your flesh because those two things are enmity with God. And that's why that I read the scripture in, Hebrew, in, in Romans chapter eight that you can mortify the deeds of the flesh through the spirit. But the only way that you can mortify them, Brother Burton, is to be aware where they come from. They come from hell. They don't come from, from God. God doesn't cause you to be, to be depressed. God doesn't cause you to be anxiety. God doesn't cause all these things. God doesn't cause loneliness. The enemy causes loneliness. And by you drawing to God, it's gonna make you lonelier to the world. But if you have the Holy Ghost, you will never ever be alone. Because the Holy Ghost will reveal to you the word that you need. Listen to this. Isolation in sociology. It's a social lack of contact between persons 
groups and whole societies. Now I can look around this building and see people that have been isolated from former churches, isolated from their family members because of what you believe. There's people that, of you that are isolated for what I believe. Say amen. amen. There's some people that don't have nothing to do with you because of what I believe or what Burton believes or what Rick believes because you're associated with us. So there's got to be some reason you keep coming back. And it's not just a place to go because there's a church house on every block. As I have Jesus' name church every, every, every 500 feet because one gets mad, the other one, they just leave, go send them up another building and preach. Some were called, some were sent, some just packed up and went. Right? I mean, really, you're, you're here for a reason. You keep coming back for something. Sometimes it gets pretty rough up here in the pulpit. But you keep coming back for some reason. It's not because you don't have anywhere to go. It's because that you accept the isolation that comes with being a child of God. You're gonna, you just, just, just effects are gonna be on you no matter what we do. The, the psychological effects, the failure of an individual to maintain contact with others or genuine communication where interaction with others persists. 20, there's 20,000 prisoners in the United States. And I'm gonna read this verbatim, but there are 20,000, whenever I've read it, I, this must be an old article, there's probably 200,000 or a million people in prison now. But 2% of them are in isolation. 2% of the people that are in prison are so incorrigible and so mean that they're not even allowed to have contact with other humans. What kind of world do we live in? That's a big enough stat to make enough people run to the altar. That there are some, there are some savage people in this world that will rape children It will cut your head off for no reason whatsoever. That will kill for no reason other than their own satisfaction. Not in retaliation or not in anger. Just because something on the inside of them says to kill. But yet the altars aren't full. So though we get more and more of those people because there's less and less people at the altar. You go back and study history the first known serial killer maybe that was a big name was Jack the Ripper, the only one in a century. Well, we've got, they estimate that there's over a thousand serial killers in the United States right now. A serial killer is a person that kills without remorse and kills repetitively. They estimate that at least a thousand of them are in the United States right now because the altars are empty, but the malls are full. The altars are empty, but the football stadiums are filled to the brim. The baseball stadiums, the basketball houses are filled to the brim. I like sports, but man, there's something wrong with people. They would rather go do those things than come into the house of the Lord. No matter how bad it is around them, no matter how many such sickness that they see, of how, it don't matter how many times they hear about somebody raping a child, they still don't go to the altar and say, God, put your hand over me and my family. That some savage like that doesn't get a hold of me. And it still doesn't guarantee that it won't. But if enough people were praying, we could repel that spirit. But we are being overrun by the enemy. That's all right. They ain't running me but one place. That's to heaven. And I'll preach against them. All their sickness and their defilements of the world. They may come in here and say, you're not preaching. I say, I'll preach it. And they may kill me. Let them kill me. Because I'm going to tell you something. The bride is going to stand for him. No matter how much isolation she goes through. The more you go in this, the more you, and the more you see, Jamie, the less people are going to want to do with you. They might want you around for your talent, but there'll come a day they'll cut you off. 
Because you're gonna have, because there'll come a day, and I'm not just saying him, but there comes a day with everybody that the decision has to be made. Somebody's gonna force you to make that decision. Somebody that you know is gonna force you to say, yes, I'm standing on this ground, or you're gonna give. One or the other. There's not, there's not any middle. There's no purgatory in this thing. It's either heaven or hell. It's either in or out. It's either lost or saved. And somebody's gonna force you to say, are you with me or not? And you're gonna make a choice. And you're gonna make it in your heart. And that choice can, can sway your final destination. I've always said I'd rather be a drunk underneath the bridge, loving God with everything I have in me and come up with judgment with that than to walk away from the word of God and reject it and take the mark of the beast and be forever lost. Amen. See, the, see, that's another thing that, just a quick aside that they lie about. The mark of the beast is coming. No, the mark of the beast is here. Okay? What did Paul, what did, what did the writer say, John? that the spirit of Antichrist doeth already work. You just take it spiritually now. And people think, don't think, and they take it spiritually, then they think they won't take it naturally. Let somebody hold a knife up to your baby's neck and watch if you won't take it. Most, pe most people don't have, a, don't have enough about them to come to church on Sunday. They're sure not gonna be able to withstand that. They ain't got enough about them to get down and pray beside their bed. They're sure not gonna withstand that. That's right. There you go. You're not gonna stand without the Holy Ghost. And if you got the Holy Ghost, you ain't gonna be here anyway. Because you're not appointed to obtain wrath, but to obtain salvation through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. They can fuss and fight over the rapture all they want to. Amen. Both sides of it can fuss and fight and carry on, and they both wrong. That's right. <laughs> Your rapture starts when you get the Holy Ghost. Amen. Your rapture starts, your destination out of here starts when you get the Holy Ghost. If you got the Spirit of God and still love this place, you ain't got the Spirit of God. Amen. There's something about the people of God, they wanna be with him. If you love your wife, you wanna be with her. At the end of my day, I look forward to going home to seeing my wife. If he loves me, he wants to be with me and she wants to be with me. You don't want me tainted running around with a bunch of other denominations, I mean women. Come on. Say amen. amen. She don't want me uh, out there running around and I don't want her out running around. Amen. I want her to be loyal to me. He wants me to be loyal to him. Amen. He wants me to love him, why? Because he loved me. Not of anything he ever done, but just because he loved me. I love him. I love him because he first loved me. Amen. Not for any special thing that he ever done. I ask Donna all the time, why do you love me? She can't give me a straight answer. And now she asks me, why do you love me? I say, I can't give you a straight answer. I just do. It's something on the inside of me. I love you and no matter what you do, I love you. You know why? Because she don't run around with other denominations. I mean men because she don't want to be handled by no other man. She don't want nobody else's arms around her but mine. And I don't want nobody else's arms around me but him. I don't care how isolated I gotta get from this world. I don't care how many devils I gotta fight, how much goes on because something inside of me that was given me from the foundation of the world loves him. It loves him more than it loves her. It loves him more than it loves my children. It loves him more than I love you. It loves him unconditionally and I can't control it. Have you ever heard of a love that you can't control? Well, I got a love I can't control. When it says come closer, I come closer. I mean, my, my flesh may not want to. My head may say, you don't need to do that. But, my, but the inner man says, yes, Lord, because I love him. Isolation is just a part of it. If you truly love somebody, if you love your spouse, you'll stay isolated from other men. You'll stay isolated from other women. Right. If you love them. Think about this. In your marriages, and nobody please answer, because everybody gets tempted. How many times have you been tempted that you didn't 
flirt or do something just because you didn't want to hurt the other person. Your flesh might have been weak. You might have had something, but just because you loved that other person and didn't want to hurt them, you abstain from going to that church. I mean, from running around with that man. Right? Amen. Just because you love him, just because you love him, you'll follow him wherever he goes. Because the dove leads the lamb. The dove don't lead a goat. It leads a lamb. Isolation. Prisoners who are isolated for prolonged periods of time have been known to experience depression, despair, anxiety, rage. You ever felt rage from being isolated? Come on now. Come on now. How many times have you got mad at that, at that old preacher when he posts stuff on the internet about you? Huh? You might not have went and choked his neck, but, in, but you're, you were in rage. Right? When he, when, uh, when your family member talked about you for the things you believed. I mean, I'm just, I'm just who I am, guys. I just have to preach it the way that it comes out. I'm sorry. Uh, but that's true. And you know why you felt that way? Because you were isolated. Because you were in solitary confinement of the devil. You were cut off from fellowship. You were cut off from everybody. You were cut off from anything that you knew. And so when you heard something strike at you, you became enraged. But that inner man held your peace, right? Because you mortified the deeds of the body through the spirit, right? Because the Holy Ghost inside of you said, don't go choke him, Jamie Jr. <laughs> Don't go start a fight, Rick. Right? Because old Rick's flesh was a boxer. And a good one. So I wouldn't want him getting after me in the flesh. So all these other people, they're, they're blessed that Rick's got the Holy Ghost. Because if he did, they might have a busted nose. Say amen. I mean, I'm just preaching the way that it is. Amen. I'm just preaching the way that it is. That if without the Holy Ghost, without something to mortify, which means to kill the deeds of the flesh, you would become so enraged with people and the things they say about you that you would probably openly argue with them. You might even take hold of them. There's two things you don't talk about, and that's religion and politics, right? You'll get somebody fired up over religion and politics before they will their own family. Say amen. amen. I hate it when they come against us on the internet. I hate it. And there's been times that I've typed stuff and deleted it. I'm just being honest. Donna say, did you get that off there? Amen. Stuff like you devil. <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. But, and there's been times I've been guilty of leaving it on there. That's why he's graceful and merciful. But if you don't learn from that lesson, then you don't have the Holy Ghost. Having the Holy Ghost doesn't mean you're not going to stumble. That just means that when you stumble, you'll quit wallowing in it. They'll keep picking on you and you'll learn how to take it eventually. You'll learn how to take it because your love for him is more than your anger. Your love for them is more than your feelings being hurt, right? When somebody won't speak to you. When you're around somebody's bed and somebody else won't speak to you that says they go to church, oh, that makes you mad as a hornet. <laughs> when you pray for somebody and nobody bows their head because it's you praying, I've been there. I've been right there. I had a fellow look at me. I told him, I said, I'll pray for you. And he said, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't say, well, I'll pray for you or thank you, brother. I said, I'll pray for you. He said, yeah. Because I didn't go to his church. But his own pastor asked me to pray for him. I don't understand, but yeah, I do understand. You don't, you're guided by this instead of by the inner man. Right. If a Catholic told me they were gonna pray for me, I'd say, you pray for me. 
You get on your knees, you go to mass, you do whatever you gotta do, you talk to Mary, Martha, Joseph, whoever it is, because I got a problem. But I'll bless you please to talk to Jesus. Because I got a problem. If you're gonna pray for me, you pray. I would never be that rude because I've got the Holy Ghost to look at you and go, yeah. But there was a time I was. There was a time I might have been that way where I might have thought in my mind, I don't want that devil praying for me. But you see, that's why the Holy Ghost that you're led and guided by the Holy Ghost. Because you make mistakes, but it corrects you through the word. Through the word. And you'll eventually, God will even even lead those people to come back to you. They'll apologize. They'll pray, they'll ask you to pray for them. There'll be people that, that have come against you and come against you openly that will come to you and apologize that will say, I'm sorry for the things I said and the things I've done. And I've had people come back and say, you handled that more like a Christian than I did. Because I chose to stay in the isolation tank. I didn't, let, I didn't, I didn't say, yeah, boss, I'll give in and, I, and I'll join in no, I chose to stay in isolation. I want you to know, don't you think I've ever thought about giving in? Do you think that, yeah, there ain't a person here ever thought about giving in and thought about going back and saying, man, it was a lot easier over there. You know, I got to, I got to sing a lot more over there or, or man, I got to preach a lot more and a lot more people accepted me. But something inside of me keeps holding me keeps holding me to the word, Brother Jamie, no matter how isolated I get. And that's what I want you to understand is you're going to be isolated. You're going to be set apart. You're going to be down. You're going to, you're going to be so angry sometimes. You're going to be hurt. Mostly you're going to be hurt. Your feelings is going to be hurt. You're going to be cast down. But the Holy Ghost will raise you up. Amen. When there's nobody else around, Brother Jamie, When you got nobody to talk to, old Job didn't have anybody. His wife had done turned against him. His kids were dead. He lost everything that he had. The people that come around and sat around him, I thought about this the other day. They'd have been better off to just come and sit down and say nothing than to say the things they said. Because the world is full of Job's friends. Everybody says, just because you find somebody in a bad way don't mean they're a sinner. Don't mean they done wrong. Just because somebody's got problems don't mean they're sinning. Just because they're not going to your church or the things you do don't mean there's something wrong. If you think there's something wrong, sit around the campfire with them a while and go through the things they go through. Walk in their shoes for a little bit. You see, that's what the Holy Ghost will teach you. Amen. The Holy Ghost is more, more often to me has taught me to shut up more than it's ever taught me to speak. Say Amen. That's why the Bible says to study to be quiet. That's right. a woman should be of a meek and a humble spirit. All those things go together, don't they? Yeah. Study to be quiet. If that's the first time you ever heard that scripture, go back and read it. It says study to be quiet. Mm-hmm. It don't signify who either. Everybody. That's, right. that's the thing about us. We talk too much. We we badger too much till you get till you get so isolated and you get to seeing how other people feel. We all been guilty of it. But great, but thanks be to God we heard his voice. It says that they have rage, claustrophobia, hallucinations. A lot of the church world has hallucinations. <laughs> they have false visions. Of uh prosperity and uh, all this crazy stuff they preach. I don't understand it. Yeah, I know you've heard them. I don't understand how a person can get on the television and bum old people out of their social security check and lay down at night and go to sleep. I, I don't understand that. Takes advantage of the mentally, disab- mentally disadvantaged or the person that's not so smart or the person that really just needs, are desperate and needing a move of God. And they don't know, they don't know anything. And they give them a thousand dollars. And this, and this, and this guy's driving around in a Cadillac and flying around in an airplane. And, and they're giving them everything. How do you do that? 
That's a robber. That's a thief. And I believe that judgment's gonna be just a little bit more worse for that fella than for somebody else. That's right, that's the devil. That's the devil. They look like the devil to me in their face. I, I swear I can see that spirit all over them. I've jumped up before and said, I'd like to cast that out of one of them. And I get raged when I think about the way they do people. But I've got to hold my silence. And I thank God that he's given me a sound mind. And he's called me. It says that they have hallucinations problem with impulse control. Say amen. Take a look around. They, a lot of them have problem with the impulse control. And you know what I'm talking about. So-and-so's running around with so-and-so. It's because they don't have any impulse control. Say amen. amen. Or they got just a little bit too much showing that shouldn't be showing. Now they can, when they round the preacher, when they round everybody, boy, they look, they look good. But you see them in, you see them somewhere else and they got some, maybe their upper half is showing. Or, or they got maybe some things that shouldn't be showing. And that's, I know it's a touchy subject because holiness is. And holiness starts from within to without. But what I'm saying is, is, is that a woman that respects herself and has been raised to respect herself is not going to show her body off to a man. Especially one with the Holy Ghost. See, they got impulse control nowadays, Kathy. The things they used to preach about, they don't preach about no more. The impulse control was on the inside. See, they looked apart for a long time, Rick, but what was on the inside had to come out. I promise you, no matter who you are, what's on the inside's gonna come out. It's gonna manifest itself to the top. It's like a worm, it'll eat itself to, if the Holy Ghost is on the inside, it'll come out. There'll be a smile, there'll be joy, there'll be love, there'll be peace, but if there's, on, but if there's something else on the inside, it's gonna come out too. There'll be hatred, strife, envy, murderings, all those things. All those things that are vile and away from God. They have impaired ability to think. That's what isolation can do to us sometimes. But thanks God for the Holy Ghost. Don't never trust your thinker, brother and sisters. Don't trust your thinker. It's wrong. Remember Esau and Jacob? Esau was the type of the flesh. Jacob was a supplanter. He was smart, but he had to have a name change and he had to have a body. He had to have a name change from Jacob to Israel. He had to leave the Jacob nature behind. This right here will get you in more trouble than this will, Rick. Because this is going along to do things of the world. This is going along for the world. It does. And if yours don't, you're aligned because it does. But this right here knows better. That's why Paul said that that I would, I do not. But that that I do, I would not. Because this will talk you into about anything. It talked a woman into forsaken paradise. She had it all, Rick. A man that loved her. Everything she wanted at her fingertips. Everything. And she forsook it all because of this thing right here. By reason, affection, love, emotion. All those things are your enemy. I promise you. Your emotions will lead you astray. Not saying that this thing isn't emotional because man, if you got the Holy Ghost, there gotta be some kind of emotion about you. But it's called stimulation by revelation. If all you got's emotion, it's not the Holy Ghost. If all you got's emotion and no revealed word, there's no Holy Ghost. It's just emotion. And that's what's happened. They run around on emotion and man, I've had them come and say, buddy, you need to come to church at our church. You need to do this and you need to do that and six months later they're hooked on drugs. And I'm not talking about them, I'm just saying they, they were running on emotion, Burton. 
They were running on, yeah, hey, man, the music's good and the preaching's good. Whoa, praise the Lord. But when it come down to living it, they wasn't nothing on the inside that they could live it by. First time the enemy come by their way, they fell because they was running on emotion and the singing dried up and the preaching wasn't as exciting anymore. It got down where they lived and they had to start coming to church and they had to, they had to, they had to start dealing with some issues and problems in their life. But yet, come to church, come on down. We're having a good time. You go to church somewhere, just be led of the Lord or be friendly, be loving. You know, everything that shouts ain't the Lord. And even those that shout out the Lord don't mean they have the Holy Ghost. We're gonna get out of here. Come on up, guys. This I didn't think would go very long. Maybe I drug it out a little bit, but <laughs> still the word. Previously healthy prisoners have developed clinical symptoms associated with psychosis or severe affective disorders including all types of psychiatric morbidity. Listen to this. Many have committed suicide. There is a walk with God that is isolated and you can commit spiritual suicide. That is a scary thing. But listen to me. When you hear the revealed word, not, not because I preach or Rick or Burton or Brother Donnie or I don't know who you listen to or what you do when you're not here. But if you hear something that's revealed and it strikes your heart and you walk away, you commit spiritual suicide. You can never go back. That's right. Say amen. amen. You reject the revealed word. I'm not talking about rejecting something. Don't, don't sit there and be scared and go, oh God, what about if I, you, you won't reject it if you love him. You'll know it's him. But he still reveals it to those that don't. And those are the ones that walk away and they commit spiritual suicide. See, isolation has some severe effects on us, fellas. It has severe effects, but it'll bring you down. What, what isolation, it seems cruel when we're isolated. And it seems bad when we're going through all these troubles. But man, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, and neither has it been revealed to them the things that God has laid up for them. You understand what I'm saying? The, Paul said he's persuaded that what? That neither death nor life right. nor principalities of powers or any such thing would separate us from the love of God. No matter if it's isolation, no matter if it's foundation shaken, no matter what goes on, the bride's gonna stick right there. She's gonna stay close to him and draw him to her. He's gonna draw close to her and she's gonna draw close to him. Amen. As they get them a song, find you a place and pray or just worship the Lord. Just, just go as the Lord would lead you.